Welcome to the instructional videos for the Consolidation Orthographic Drawing Stream. In this video, we will continue working through the principles and processes of architectural orthographic drawing. And in this instance, we're going to specifically focus on small things, such as the representation of stairs and coding of drawings. When we start producing multi-level buildings, we will inevitably begin drawing stairs and spaces through multiple levels. Stairs are particularly important as they are both a key architectural moment in a design proposition, but also on a simpler level they act as another cue to drawing coordination and the interrelationship of plans over multiple levels. In this drawing example we have used the pavilion from the representation of detail instructional and stretched it so that it is now a three-level lookout tower. The conventions work in the same way with multi-level buildings as single-level buildings. However, we also need to coordinate between plans and begin to navigate the reader through the various heights and points in space. An additional element we have included here is a series of level indicators running along the side of the section. These level indicators show where the floor levels exist in space as well as the naming convention used to describe the different floor plates. Each of these level indicators will also often provide a finished floor level that also acts as a benchmark level for each floor. The graphic shows a simplified arrow pointing to the projected level with the height and naming information positioned above. When drawing the stairwell, it is important to stick to the relevant orthographic convention. For the level 1 plan, we can see the stair starting its journey up the tower. As we know, unless otherwise shown, Plans are usually cut just above the sill height, which usually translates to around 1200 millimetres above the floor. We show the stair cutting off here at approximately 1200 above the floor, and we show the cutoff of the stair with an angled cutoff line. The reason we would show the cutoff line at an angle that is different to the stair tread is so that the cutoff line is not confused with a stair tread. We show the direction of the stair rise with an arrow pointing up. The arrow should always start from the middle of the first stair and continue to the cutoff line. We draw an arrow to show the direction of the stair. In most instances, the stair arrows always point up. If we draw arrows pointing up and down, it can become confusing. This is by no means a golden rule, as you will find many architectural drawings showing stair arrows going up and down. In the instances where stair arrows are mixed, then you always need to write on the direction of the arrow, either up or down. If no direction is written on the stair arrow, then the assumption is that the stair arrow points up. Moving to level 2, we continue our stairwell. However, we have the complication in that there is one stair above the other. This is a very typical scenario, so it is important to be consistent with the convention. The stairwell going from level 2 up to level 3 is very similar to the one we have just drawn on the plan below. So we would show the cutoff as we would for the stair that we showed on level 1. But because we are on a level above, we would also see the stair connecting level 1 to level 2. To show this part of the stair, we would draw a second cutoff line and finish off the stair connecting level 1 with level 2. We need to be consistent with the stair arrows, remembering to start and finish the arrow at the start and finish of the stairs, and to make sure the arrow points up unless noted otherwise. We finish off the stairwell on level 3 by showing the final run of stairs connecting from level 2 to level 3. We would not show another cutoff in this instance because there is not a stair leaving level 3, and we are simply looking down to the stairway coming up from level 2. We would finish off the suite of plans with a roof plan. In this instance we have shown the detail of the roof sheeting, the flashings and the gutter. We have shown the general outline of the plan below with a hidden detail line to help with the coordination between plan drawings. On the level 3 plan we have done a similar thing where we have shown the outermost outline of the roof above and we've indicated this with an overhead detail line. We have also included the general roof geometry on the level 3 plan, again with an overhead line style to finish off the coordination. Note on the roof plan that we have also shown some arrows that indicate the direction of the roof fall. This is good practice, especially with hipped or gabled roofs, 
as it helps interpret the drawing quickly. Arrows that show roof falls typically point down to indicate the fall of the roof. As our drawings and projects become more complicated, we will need to add more information to the drawing to both interpret between levels as well as understanding ground levels, falls and identifying special elements such as doors and windows. Referring back to the instructional representation of detail, we need to be mindful about how much information we put on our drawings depending on the intended reader of the drawing. There are no rules or conventions governing this and it comes down to your own judgement to determine what level of detail is appropriate. Here we have added more detail to the basic set of plans for our folly tower. A lot of terminology used to describe things in drawings can be rather long-winded so we would normally codify repeated expressions, items and acronyms. We would include the legend explaining those abbreviations somewhere on the drawing. If we use a right-hand title block as shown on this slide, we would typically position the legend in the top right-hand corner of the title bar. It is important to include all abbreviations used and never assume that the reader of the drawing understands your abbreviations. Many abbreviations relate to height information such as finish floor level and ground levels. These are written in meters, usually to two or three decimal places. This is similar to when we read the heights when doing the simple survey as part of the T2 consolidation series. Note that we have also shown the location of the project benchmark and its height. For most contract drawings we would also number each room of the project with a unique number. Each architectural practice has their own method for coding rooms but typically a room would be referenced by its level and then its sequential number. Doors and windows would then key off the room numbering system so that each element could be identified separately. This is especially important when we produce drawings for builders. Finally, we have also included numbers on the risers so that it is very clear how the stairwell works. This is not done universally and is not a convention per se, but again, many architectural practices do adopt this approach. This ends the architectural drawing miscellany instructional in the consolidation series of the architectural orthographic drawing workshops. Make sure to follow up with the other instructionals in the consolidation series. Thanks again for your time.